There's an inside joke about that, guys. <laughs> Aloha, everybody. Welcome to the government operations hearing today, Tuesday, March 14th, 2024, convened in conference room 225. Meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. In the unlikely event, we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. This committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 3.06 p.m. Tuesday, March 19th, 2024, in conference room 225. And a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. In order to facilitate this hearing in a timely manner, we will enforce a two-minute limit on testimony, although I have a suspicious feeling we won't need to really be strong on that one. Okay, um, first up, we will start with the first bill on the agenda, House Bill 2070, House Draft 1, relating to procurement. Uh, first up, we have uh, Tim Lyons, President of Subcontractors. Okay, written in support. Um, Steve Tebbs. Okay, thank you, Ms. Tebbs, I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, Ryan Sakuda, GCA. We stand on a written testimony and support. Okay, thank you. And we've seen this bill before. Uh, next up is we have John Romanowski, VP for Jask Lover, written in support. Um, Darren Imada, Glenn Kanashigi for Moss and Nordic PCL, respectively, written in support. Uh, we have Roland Eugenio for King and Neil. Written in support, Dale Yonetta, SM, Sakamoto in support. Lance Inouye, I don't see him, but written in support. And then finally, we have late from Mr. Fred Kim for Alan Shintani. Written in support. That's all we have on the measure. Anybody in the audience or Zoom wishing to testify? Seeing none, members, questions on this bill we've seen before. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is. House Bill 2496, House Draft 1, again, relating to procurement. This is the alternative procurement bill. First up, we have Department of Transportation. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we also have Bonnie Kahakui, uh, State Procurement Office. And you the new director. <laughs> <laughs> good, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. Bonnie Kahagui for the State Procurement Office. We stand on a written testimony in opposition to the current language, but offer suggestions to revise a, another section that would uh, fulfill the intent of the um, intent of the bill. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. That's all we have on this measure, 204096. Anybody in the audience is in wishing to testify? Seeing none, a member question. Okay. We'll definitely round up with you guys later on on the bill. So thank you for being here. If not, we'll move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is 2238 House Draft 1. This is relating to non-general funds. Um, first up, we have the comptroller. They have written with comments. And then Tom Yamachika, Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Is he or anybody from Tax Foundation on Zoom? Yes, he, uh, he is available on Zoom. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, what's left of it anyway. Uh, this is Tom Yamachika from the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. Um, we are we are more interested in the second half of the bill because the House uh, Finance Committee has re has inserted raid language. So we want to know what's going to go in there. Right now it's blank. Um, and it, I don't see any su supportive testimony for raiding. Uh, so I'm just kind of wondering what's going to happen with that. That's what we have to do. Okay. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, anybody else on Zoom or the audience wishing to testify? Seeing none, member question. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is House Bill 1946, House Draft 2, relating to process improvement, um, funds for a three year pilot program. Uh, first up, we have Department of Health. <coughs> They have written testimony and comments. Um, that's all we have on this measure. Anybody in the audience or Zoom wishing to testify? Seeing none, we can't ask any questions because the department's not here. So we'll, we'll move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is House Bill 2482, House Draft 1, relating to meeting notices. Uh, first up, we have Office of the Lieutenant Governor. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, 
members of the committee on TV. Michelle Kurihara Klein on behalf of our Lieutenant Governor Sylvia Luke and the Office of the Lieutenant Governor. You have our testimony before you, which is in strong support. However, we, um, after submitting, we were notified of the Office of Information Practices testimony, which cited an, an additional section that should be amended to conform um, to the postings. And so I wanted to amend our written testimony with oral testimony to say that we strongly support OIP's amendments and request your favorable consideration. Okay. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank, thank you so much, Mayor Michelle. Uh, next up, we have OIP. Afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair Cheryl Kakazi Park, OIP Director. And our um, amendment would apply the same language or well, essentially apply this um, amendment to the emergency notice provisions as well so that the boards don't have to provide physical copies of those types of notices. So I hope you will agree to that additional amendment as well. Okay. Thank you. Is that the one the, the LG's office was referring yeah, to? Yeah, okay. exactly. All right, just make sure on that. Okay, uh, we have next Bren, Ben Kreps, Public First Law Center in Zoom. There he is. Hi, good afternoon, Chair, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, ben Kreps for the Public First Law Center. We respectfully oppose the House Draft 1 and ask that this measure be reverted to its original form. Uh, the HD1 removes the meeting notice filing requirement, which would eliminate the official record for public meeting notices. Um, and without that official record, there will be needless disputes over the sufficiency or authenticity of certain uh, meeting notices. Um, so we ask that this measure be reverted to its original form. Thank you for considering our testimony. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Peter Fritz, attorney law. Is he on Zoom? Yes, he is on Zoom, Chair. I had to start my video and... Not sure exactly what happened. Okay. Can you, you now, go ahead. Okay. now I can see you. Um, uh, as chair, vice chair, my name is Peter Fritz. I'm an individual with a disability. And when the OIP first proposed electronic filing on the calendar, I raised an issue regarding accessibility of individuals with disabilities. Somebody who has Parkinson's is going to have a tough time typing in the name. Somebody who's a quadriplegic, also is going to have a problem typing in the address one character at a time. Um, eliminating the filing with the lieutenant governor is an issue because the state calendar records posting, but it doesn't record the posting of the agenda. I saw a posting today that posted a meeting saying agenda will be filed later. With the lieutenant governor, there's not a question about that. And I do think that how uh, the original bill addresses those particular issues, but I also think since it's going to be part of an official record that you need to be filed both with the Lieutenant Governor and on the state calendar. I am aware of situations where people did not file with the Lieutenant Governor and they did file on the state calendar. So to have the type of filing that we need and the assurances that the agendas that are filed are correct and proper, I think that it is appropriate to go back to the House Draft 1 and to remove the section that says that if you don't file with the Lieutenant Governor, no harm, no foul, because there is. Uh, I will stay around if you have any questions regarding accessibility, but from an accessibility standpoint, it does present many, many obstacles if the only way you can get a an agenda is on the state calendar. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Okay, thank you for being here, Mr. Fritz. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, next up we have John Burnett, immediate past president, Big Island Press Club. They are in opposition. Um, let's see, we have Nancy Cook Lauer testifying for all Hawaii News, written in opposition, and Robert Dewar testifying for Albatross News, also in opposition. That's all we received on 2482. Is there anybody in the audience or Zoom wishing to testify? Seeing none, member question. No, oh, okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is House Bill 1598, House Draft 1, relating to the Sunshine Law. This is a board packets measure. Uh, first up, we have Cheryl Park, OIP. We'll stand on members testimony. 
Okay, great. Offering comments? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Sterling Morita, um, Hawaiian chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, written support, and Ben Kreps on Zoom. IT, is he there? No. Oh, there, there he is. Go ahead, sir. Hey, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair. Um, ben Krebs for the Public First Law Center. We strongly support this measure and we appreciate this committee's interest in it. Um, the Senate Judiciary Committee passed out a virtually identical companion of this measure. That was SB 2638, SD1. Um, and, and that bill included some additional language that this committee may wish uh, to include here. And that basically uh, provides an itemization of what um, materials are being provided in the board packet. Um, and uh, otherwise, this bill makes two small tweaks to the board packet provision, as you know, uh, and this will promote informed public participation. Thank you again for hearing this measure. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, we have, I think that's all we have. Act. Anybody in the audience wishing to testify or on Zoom? Member a question on board packets? If not, we'll move on to the next one on the agenda, which is House Bill 2339, House Draft 1. Oh, yes. Uh, relating to 911 services deletes the term enhanced uh, out of 911. First up, we have, uh, let's see. Did I skip a bill here? I did skip a bill. My bad, everybody. My bad. Um, HP 1600 House Trap 1. This is open meetings. Um, measure Shell Park YP. We'll stand in support uh, of the Rich's recording chart. Okay, thank you. So Doug Meller, League Women Voters. Uh, Ben Kreps on Zoom. Again, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, Ben Kreps for the Public First Law Center. Uh, we strongly support this bill too, and we appreciate the committee hearing it. It's another Sunshine uh, housekeeping bill, and it codifies an existing interpretation from OIP that requires a minimum of six days between a permitted interaction group's report uh, and any board action on that report. I and mean, what this does is ensure that the public has time to digest the reports and the materials and participate meaningfully in any subsequent discussions. Thank you again, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, finally, Lynn Matso, uh, individual written support. That's all we have on 1600. Anybody else wishing to testify? Seeing none, member question. Seeing none, we will move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is House Bill 1599, House Draft 1. First up, we have uh, EUTF. Okay. Um, next up, we have OIP. So for this one, I would like to refer to our written testimony, but also emphasize that I don't know if there may be unintended consequences as a result of this bill, because I'm not sure whether um, the agencies are really going to have the ability to um, protect against Zoom bombing when yeah. they have no prior notice, and that yeah. it could become maybe a means for groups to engage in concerted, act, concerted action to try and stop a meeting from going forward. Mm -hmm. So I just bring that up as a potential that you guys can decide and think about. Yeah, well, among other things, yeah. actually, moving to your point. Uh, next up, H the, uh, sorry, ACLU. We have written in support and Mr. Ben Kreps, are you there? Go ahead, yes. sir. Good afternoon again. Uh, so, so we strongly support this bill too, and it proposes a small tweak to the Sunshine Law with big impacts. Uh, so this measure ensures that remote testifiers like myself today uh, have the option to be seen and heard. Um, seeing each other is critical to civil discourse. And I, I understand that perhaps there may be some current concerns about Zoom bombing, but there are uh, technical solutions for that, and that should not be an impediment to public access. Thank you very much, and I'm available for any questions. Hey, thank you very much. That's all we have. Anybody else in the audience wishing to testify? Seeing none, member question. Um, I don't know, Ben, if, are you still on? Yes. Just, uh, yeah, no, just on the part where it allows the board to remove, um, you know, those, that, you know, recognizing the board's authority to remove and block individuals who disrupt meetings remotely. Do you think that could be potentially, I guess, used as a sword as, and as well as a shield that, you know, you could have boards remove people 
who don't like the way that people are testifying or the manner in which they're testifying. You see what I'm saying? Or uh, potentially, but but uh, frankly, it's it seems like the benefits would out, outweigh any uh, any risk of that. The techn technological solutions exist, and you know, Zoom is used for court hearings and, and all kinds of uh, proceedings, and so it's pretty standard today, and and folks are pretty familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate you giving us some feedback on that. That thank being you. said, we'll move on to 2339. Now it's relating to 911 services. Uh, first up, we have Doug Murdoch, CIO. Uh, we have Leo Sunshion, Public Utilities Commission. Well, Chair, my chair, David, it's going to be here on the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, next up, we have Royce Murakami for 911. Thank you very much. Uh, we have Matt Kurihara, Captain for Honolulu Police Department. Go ahead, sir. Good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, uh, Captain of the Communication Division, uh, Honolulu Police Department. We stand on our written testimony and I'll be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we next up have Daryl Branson, National Association 911, written in support, Keith Regan, Comptroller, written in support, uh, Stephanie Courtney, Deputy Director for the City and County of Honolulu IT, written in support, uh, Corey Schaefer, Chair for the E911 Board, written in support, uh, we have Eddie Fujioka, EMS Chief of Comms, retired. Individual in support, and that is all we have on two three three nine. Uh, is there anybody in the audience or Zoom wishing to testify? Seeing none, I guess I'm the only one here to ask questions. Royce, why don't you come on up? Just so we could pick up the conversation we had on the Senate version of this bill. You know, we went ahead and amended it to reduce the fees. You know, being charged to people because of the what appeared to be all this money within the fund that yes. wasn't being utilized. Mm -hmm. But since then, you said that even if you wanted to, you couldn't utilize the money because there's a ceiling on what you can spend. Can you explain that further? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we have to oh, come to the microphone close. Pull the microphone close. Yeah, we have to submit a budget request to legislature. So the same process. So it goes through the WAM budget briefings mm -hmm. in the beginning of the year. So last year we did a temporary ceiling increase just for the transition for next gen. Mm -hmm. So it went from nine to eleven million, um, but that's only till twenty twenty five. So, mm -hmm. um, as stated in our testimony, um, come twenty twenty six, so next session, we're going to be asking for a permanent ceiling increase mm -hmm. to it, increase the nine million. Okay, what, why not just increase it up to I guess the maximum so you can spend? If you, that were to happen, could you spend down all the money that's in the E nine one one account that's there? That you know that you have all this money there. Could that money then be deployed or uh, if the ceiling were raised? Um, yes, but at the same time, we don't want to expend the entire fund because that's is what support and maintains the system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. We're going to move on to the next bill on the agenda, which is 2480. The apostille certification of documents, one in testifier, one only, Office of Lieutenant Governor. Thank you, Charles. That other testimony of Charles Bush. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, that's it. No, uh, any I don't have any questions. So we'll move on to the next agenda on the bill or bill on the agenda, which is 2524. First up, we have Robin Matsunaga Ombudsman. Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members, um, I stand on my written testimony, but I, I wanted to uh, emphasize that the point of my testimony is that the proposed amendment in section one of this bill will create a special class of complainants who would be entitled to pref preferential treatment if I with my office. And that's pretty much contrary to the concept of fair treatment that's an essential characteristic of the ombudsman function. And I understand the, um, the concern with the timely resolution of these disputes that homeowners have with their homeowners association. But 
um, to create that special class of um, complaints, uh, I think is um, concern to me. Thank you, Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here to testify. Uh, Derek Yamani, Chairperson, Real Estate Commission. Very much. Uh, Lila Maurer, Kukua Council. Okay, um, next Aloha. up. Oh, go ahead. You have two minutes. Go ahead, Lila. Thank you. Aloha Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Mahalo for the opportunity to testify in support of House Bill 2524, House Draft 1. I stand on my testimony as written. However, I've omitted this important concern. I've learned from you that words matter. In the context of this measure and 514B, an association is an organization of unit owners. Usually it is the board of directors and not the association itself who is alleged by its owners to be in violation of an association's governing documents or 514B. The proposal is unclear if by the word association, reference is to the board of directors. If so, the measure should be amended to reflect the board and not the association. Mahalo. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you testifying. Sandy Wong, individual. <clears throat> okay, uh, written in opposition, we have Christine Morrison, individual. Is she on Zoom? Uh, no, they're both unavailable on Zoom. Okay, so they too, they have written in support. And then finally, Lord Shebert. Yes, they are here on Zoom. Okay, um, finally, we have Mark McKellar, Mark McKellar, LLC. Yeah. Written in opposition. I don't. Oh, I'm here. I'm here. Okay, Lord, uh, go ahead and testify. You have two minutes. Okay. Hi. Um. Thank you for um listening to me. In 2016, I sat before you, Senator McKelvey, with a uh, retaliation. Out of it came the retaliation bill. Um. From that retaliation, it can pretty much be referred to the uh, measure that you've written, SB 402, where the complaints that, that I had was pretty much per paragraph that you've written. But what I'm trying to say is that I'm a really big supporter of prevention first. This SB uh, 402 is very, it's a very good bill to push forward. Um, I think the CAMs should be um, licensed because it gives them the respect from the board members to pay attention to what their advice is. And this is a lot of problems that you're having between the board and um, people, minority board members that recognize that because they're not mandated to do education, they can do anything they want to. I think the CAM is, is a good licensing because you have um, beauty salons, you have mechanics, they're in the straight line, same line and definition of being able to um, have a professional DCCA license. And this will help the board and help prevention to get to the ombudsman. And then the ombudsman has more serious um, problems or issues to look at. But my support is being in maintenance, prevention and um, preventive ma maintenance is what I excel in. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lord. I appreciate you being here and testifying. Uh, let's see, we also have Daryl Duboff. Uh, let's see, oh, go ahead, sir, you have two minutes. Oh. Thank you. Um, there are two of us, one is Sandy DeBuff, whom you can see there, and the other is myself, Daryl Wilson. Um, I, I think I'm speaking first, so I'll just go ahead. Uh, I adopt uh, the written testimony that Mrs. DeBuff has put in, and, and thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Chair and Mr. Vice Chair, to speak to this. Um, my uh, Our issue is um, I'm a retired uh, lawyer from uh, Alberta, and uh, the issue that I see that needs to be addressed in this bill is that relates to cumulative voting. So the current scheme of 514B allows 
homeowners associations to decide if they want to have cumulative voting or not for the election of directors. And those that select cumulative voting then can accumulate their vote for one director, which allows a minority voice to be represented on the board. The difficulty with the current legislation is that it, it allows for removal of directors um, without notice <laughs> at the same annual general meeting uh, in which they are elected. So you have the scenario where the minority elects Mr. A to be one of the directors to fill an open position. And then uh, immediately thereafter, the minority brings a motion to remove them and thus uh, takes away the minority uh, voice and replaces it with another majority voice. And so the, the removal legislation emasculates the rights of current homeowners associations that have elected for cumulative voting. And this dichotomy needs to be addressed in your amendment of 514B in my humble submission. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, why don't you go ahead, ma'am? You're up next, two minutes, please. Okay, uh, what Daryl is referring to is section 106F in 514B. And that says that uh, to remove a director, you need majority of vote, and then otherwise in accordance with all applicable procedures and requirements in the bylaws. Now, our bylaws specifically say that if there are sufficient votes to elect a director by cumulative voting, then if there's a if that same number votes against it, the director doesn't get removed. And the legislature has the same language in 414 D 138. And also in uh, they just two years ago, the legislature added it to 421 J. 3.3, and I've included those sections with my materials, with the testimony. But our lawyer, our outside counsel, and our parliamentarian tell us, because in 2005, the predecessor of statute, when it was 514A, took out the words at the end when it said, removing in accordance with all applicable you know, requirements uh, with the bylaws, it took out the words, including cumulative voting. And so we've been told because the words including cumulative voting were removed, it means that all, we don't have that protection in 514B. So as an unincorporated association, we don't have the same protections as an incorporated association under 414D or a planned community under 521. So if it's not the legislature's intent, to basically take away our rights for cumulative voting, which are in our bylaws, then legislature has to make it clear at the end of 106F that cumulative voting is a factor to consider. So if a, a cumulative voting elects a director, the same class or group that elects a director should be the one to remove, not the yeah. others. Okay. So that that was, and we know there hasn't that topic hasn't been introduced the yep. legislature. We wanted to get it into. No, I'm I'm really glad you brought it up. That's a huge thing. We got real estate commission here taking notes, and so we are going to be deferring decision making on all these bills to next Tuesday, so we can discuss this further with the members and such. But thank okay. you. Well, thank you for your time. Okay, so uh, that's a huge problem, people. Um, let's see. That's all we have on the measure itself. Uh, anybody on that measure mm -hmm. issues raised? Okay, I really appreciate it. Okay, anybody else going once? Uh, this is Greg Masakian on Zoom. Yes, you got two minutes, sir. Go ahead. Um, my name is Greg Masakian, and I currently serve as first vice president of the Kakua Council, sub district two vice chair of the Waikiki Neighborhood Board, and a director on my condominium association's board. While I support the intent of this bill, I have concerns that it will empower the wrong group to provide oversight and enforcement of condominium related laws within HRS 514B. As I said in my written testimony, I have concerns regarding conflict of interest with one of the real estate commissioners who also works for Associa, a property management company overseeing condominium associations throughout Hawaii. Yesterday, after submitting my written testimony, I discovered that my condominium association's board president had recently taken a new job as an associate attorney with Kobayashi Sugita and Goda, 
which is the law firm we use for our association. He had brought this law firm and our current association attorney to us a few years ago after our last association attorney and law firm quit us due to concerns that, that they had. He has given KSG and the attorney a lot of work in the past few years, and I have raised concerns as an owner and now as a director that much of the work given was unnecessary, was done without the board's knowledge or a proper vote by the board, and in some cases was unlawful, including unlawful retaliation and violation of HRS 514B-191. There are three simple words for this, quid pro quo, and I can't stress to this committee enough how serious this is. I ask you to please amend HB 2524 HD1 by incorporating language from SB 3205, which is an ombudsman measure, and provide an independent ombudsman's office where over one third of the population can go to address serious issues that are only getting worse every day. I apologize for my voice, I've been sick, and I apologize I also didn't say aloha to the chair, vice chair, and the members at the beginning because of the way I was introduced. But I, I do thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I hope you read my written testimony. It is an eye-opener, and I appreciate the time. Definitely will. Thanks, Greg, for being able to jump in. Okay, uh, anybody else on Zoom or the audience on this measure? Seeing non-members questions? Yes. Go ahead, yes. Um, Robin, our ombudsman. So there are a number of different ombudsmen. It, would you object if another ombudsman is created? I mean. Like we have a long-term care ombudsman that's not in your office, but it's an office of aging. And maybe it's more appropriate to have an ombudsman within the DCCA for condominium disputes rather than your office. What do you think about that? I'm not opposed to the legislature creating additional ombudsman offices. Uh, with respect to the um, subject matter that um, of this bill and other bills that have been trying to create a uh, condominium related ombudsman in uh, DCCA, uh, because that office would be handling private disputes and my office was created specific specifically as an oversight agency for governmental actions, yeah. it wouldn't be appropriate to put that function in my office. So yeah. it would be better to put it in a different, uh, like an executive branch agency. Or something. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, seeing none, we've come to the last bill on the agenda. So for all the measures that were heard today, today uh, the recommendation members is one of the deferred decision-making on all of them, time certain to Tuesday, 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 March 19th, 2024, at 3 p.m. in conference room 225. Okay, this concludes this hearing. Right inside, yeah. Well, hi, everybody. Sorry for the delay. Welcome to the joint hearing between Government Operations and Labor and Technology, Tuesday, March 14th, 2024, convening conference room 225. Meeting is being streamed live on YouTube in the likely event. We have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. We will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 3.07 p.m. Tuesday, March 19th, 2024, in this room, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. And again, in order to facilitate this hearing in a timely manner, we will be enforcing the customary two minute limit on testimony. With that being said, the first, uh, of course, my committee friend, Labor Technology. Okay, and uh, for LBT, uh, thank you very much, Chair, for LBT. The event that uh, there's some catastrophic technological you know, meltdown. Um, we're, we're gonna reconvene, LBT will be reconvening tomorrow uh, March 15th in room 224 at 3.15 p.m., okay? All right, up first, House Bill 1832, uh, House Draft 1, relating to hiring. Okay. This is uh, in regards to the minimum qualification review. Okay, up first, we have uh, Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. Thank you very much. Up uh, next, we have HHFTC. 
Okay, also with comments. Okay, we have the herd director. Okay, thank you very much, Director. Up next, we have the Department of Law Enforcement. Okay, thank you very much. Up next, we have uh, Director DOT, Director Sniffin. On uh, they're, uh, no, they're unavailable on Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with comments, okay, we have DPED Director, Director Tokioko. Also with comments, we have United Public Workers. Chair, Vice Chair, Scott Kaiwa, United Public Workers, and the testimony support. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is there any others wishing to testify? House Bill 1832, House Draft 1. Okay, seeing none, members, questions? Chair. Vice Chair. I'm back here. <laughs> Aloha. Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> so, could I have uh, the director? Um, of HRD, please. <clears throat> so, hi. Good Can afternoon. You... Rana Hashimoto, Director of DHERD. Thank you. Uh, I see the demand for, you know, really getting recruitment, especially with our vacancies by all the departments. So um, it's all coming down on you. <laughs> so I, I'm just wondering, addressing their concerns um, and looking at your concerns, is there any way that you can resolve this in a way that um, it won't have the negative impacts that you talk about, but also really expedite the hiring by departments when they have such needs and they're unique in departments? Sure. So um, just yesterday, we launched a new uh, recruitment um, delegation. Uh, many of you may know that um, for the last several decades, we've allowed departments to um, request and, and get approval to handle the full scope of their recruitment um, process for classes that are unique to their department. So for example, Department of Transportation has pages of delegation. In fact, I brought it with me. They, they have many, many classes which are unique to DOT and they have delegation to handle the full scope from advertising to screening to hiring everything. Um, and they do that independently of DHERD. Right now, well, up until yesterday, we had only eight departments that took advantage of that opportunity to take delegation. So um, one of the challenges that we, we had was what do we do about classes where there are um, classes of work that are found in many departments. We feel that that's really DHERD's responsibility to handle those classes for efficiency, for the, um, the benefit of the whole state taking on, on that work. However, we do recognize that some departments have urgent needs. And so we uh, launched a new delegation yesterday called the HOLO delegation, which departments can similarly request approval to handle um, recruitment for classes of work, which may be shared among several departments. So um, like I said, it just went out yesterday. So we're waiting to see what, um, what kind of interest there will be. But um, under our old delegation, only eight departments took advantage of that. So I think it's, it's just another tool available to them, but whether they, um, whether it, it's um, widely accepted and, and utilized, that remains to be seen. I suspect that some departments will want to um, take on further delegation, but I don't think that they'll take it on to the extent of doing all of their recruitment. I think they'll probably pick and choose recruitments that are of, of particular interest or need at that time and, and want to take those on because of their own staffing challenges. So if, if this bill is passed, um, what, what in terms of your new HOLO program, this program that you have can be incorporated in so that uh, it is available for departments and you can help departments uh, in their delegation? Because I know that even if it's delegated, uh, you still need to be sure that they meet some mi minimum qualification standards. Right. right. So what I find most problematic about this bill is not the recruitment piece. I think, you know, there's already um, chapter 76-5, which allows DHER to delegate. So that's already in statute. But what I find problematic about the current measure is section C, which allows uh, departments to change the MQs unilaterally without 
um, without regard to what is standard across the state. And, and the reason that's so problematic for me is I believe that that will lead to, um, to claims of discrimination. Because for example, if a job requires one year of experience, but a department decides, oh, I'm only wanting to consider, I'll consider six months. But if we've advertised that as being one year, then individuals who have just six months of experience won't know that they should apply. If departments can just pick and choose and modify in any any fashion that they decide, um, I, I believe that that's problematic. So that's the most problematic section of this bill. Otherwise, the recruitment piece, I think, is already allowable. And we're moving in that direction to allow departments to exercise delegation. So so in, in this bill, if you were to amend it, um, so that we don't have this whipsaw effect or you know you're having different standards from different departments how might you amend this bill so that um just that part of it is is um consistent because i i think that that is that may be problematic if you've got a number of departments with the same um classes being recruited Right. And, and I should also point out that departments can change the MQs. It's not as if they're set in stone, but they do need to work with us because, for example, if, you know, if we change the MQs for secretaries, we want to make sure that all the departments have a voice and weigh in and we match up those MQs with the job duties. So we make sure that every MQ is justified, that we're not creating artificial barriers to public service by um, unilaterally changing something. And, you know, <coughs> My, my fear is that there's already this perception that um, state jobs are who you know and you know is, you have to have an in or you have to know somebody. So this will just further um, exacerbate those arguments by allowing managers or departments to, to change things without having to justify it and line it up with the class specs with the, um, and, and reach consensus about, about that job. I, I, most problematic is, is section C lines um, 18 and 19, where it talks about that they may consider any alternative qualifications and substitutions that may be used in place of the minimum qualifications. That's exceedingly broad. And I find very problematic. So if, if I mean, I'm just looking at, because so many departments are having this problem that, you know, that to give them, as you say, the opportunity to, um, to, to uh, screen on their own. If in fact you change that to say, if they use alternative or substituted um, MQs, that they just come to you first, would that work? So that at least you know about it. So you can say department A, department C and D are, are using these substitutions uh, so that at least there isn't this whipsaw effect or you know one being um, different than other departments. So you have this just possible discrimination claims. Well, I think it's it's more than just coming to us, but we need to formalize what those changes are. And it should apply to all jobs that are similarly situated. If we make a change to say one secretary to, why just that one position and why not all of them? Um, Chair, may I have questions? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Senator, I'm going to I've been these. talking at the bit, <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. I, I, felt, okay. I felt the presence there. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, um, I sort of echo Senator Moriwaki's, but I'm thinking, would you consider a pilot program? Because I'm looking at a, de like Department of Health has long-term 40% vacancies, and they're telling me that they find qualified people, but then the herd won't even list the jobs. I'm thinking about CWS with a 25% social worker, long-term vacancy. And I don't see a, a problem with allowing them to change at least during the interim, during this emergency times, when we need to increase social workers to prevent child abuse and child deaths, when we need to increase um, health personnel in the state Hawaii State Hospital to prevent deaths of employees, that we cannot allow the agencies themselves to determine the kind of qualifications needed so that they can fill those vacancies and we can have safety in these areas. So what do you think about pilot program until at least we can fill them up? 
usually yeah, there's absolutely. there's oftentimes two components to the the minimum qualifications it's education like social workers have to have a degree in social work right and then the other piece is typically an experience requirement so if they're saying that they're not qualified they don't meet the MQs. It's they're they're most, just saying they can't get it filled. Mo most often it's because perhaps they don't have the X number of years of experience, right? Which means they just can hire them at a lower level, train them up, and then they're, they can be promoted to that higher level. We often find that individuals uh, apply for jobs, for higher level jobs, because they like that salary, when they really meet the qualifications and the MQs at, say, a lower level. And they, if they came in at the lower level and trained up, they could be promoted to that higher level that is their objective position. So I'm just going to say, I, I understand your concern about people claiming that, you know, it's like who you know to get state jobs. But the reality is the state is dying for workers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that is the common sentiment now. It may have been back in the 80s and the 90s, but I don't think that that's the sentiment now. Now we are begging people to come to work. So um, I disagree. I, uh, from what the department heads are telling me, they say that the problem is with be heard and not with them. So um, I would really suggest at least a pilot program for, to allow the department heads to just to determine the own, yes, just pass the bill. and for passing the just bill. Just pass the bill, I'll do it and then some. Thank right, you. But, okay, thank you very much, um, members. Any other questions? I'm sorry about that, Chair. Sorry. Other <laughs> no, well, I mean, it makes it an internal question. You know, why, why have it here? Why not have it in all the different agencies? I mean, the businesses it seems fit with their own HR process. It doesn't work. I'm just uh, sorry, everybody. I'm just recapping <laughs> the greater that, discussion. That, these are our but anyway, um, but Go ahead, Chair. I'm done with that. Okay, thank, thank you, you Chair. Uh, Senator Favela. Uh, the question I have uh, is really just a concern of, oh, sorry, to just a concern of our dire need of workers. Um, pass the bill. Um, should we have a time? I mean, I don't know if we <coughs> working that into the bill, but because to address your concern, so we like address our concern on the humankiness of, uh, I don't know if that's a word, uh, vacancies, but going forward, I can understand your concern. And I share with with, uh, with Senator Joy over there uh, that, yeah, maybe in the 80s and stuff like that, but we get too much parameters now and people get phones and everything to say, hey, this lady is somebody's cousin or whatever. You know, there's, there's too much of that now. Maybe in the 80s, like she said, but not now. We really, really need something like this. So the suggestion is when we pass it, what would you want to see how long? Five years? I don't know if it's in a bill. I'm just talking out of turn, sorry. But five wow. years, <laughs> 10 years, no seven years. I mean, I, I don't know, right? Because until we feel, what was it doing 50% capacity of all state jobs? I mean, something to you or, or to departments to work with because we have some that is very much vacant. So if they come up to seventy five percent or eighty, we change this or amend it. I, I don't. I don't know, chairs. I just speaking out of my, you know. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Was, was, was there a question there? That was a question. Okay. That was a okay. question. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let me rephrase. Sorry. No more Dela Cruz and uh, Donna in here for interpreters. Here's my interpreter. Sorry. Sorry. It is the, the question is when we pass this yeah, bill. Sunset. Yeah, what you what a sunset? What, you know, you want to do a royal sunset or ever for, sunset? For a pilot. Right, pilot right. You know, instead of a pilot, we need this. We do need it. We all agree yeah, we need it. Pilot and assess. Yeah. There you go. See, he said close enough. Royal sunset. <laughs> well, well, and then we figure out a sunset later on. Yeah. I like the pilot. Okay. All right. Th thank you for coming. Uh, director, I, I do have a few questions. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, trick question. So, <laughs> so again, if departments do come to you, so what's the process? What's the timeline? What what is a reasonable timeline that the departments can actually get what they need to address the the concerns in the bill? I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm not following you. On um, wh which part are we talking about? So we're talking about mainly when they come to you because you had already mentioned in testimony that uh, the bill is unnecessary because they heard already allows. Yeah departments to request and grant delegated authority. So if right. there's, um, you know, if departments do come to you 
and Department of Health was a, an example where they have come to you and they were, um, I don't know if the right term is rebuffed or, you know, or, or what have you. you know, so what is a reasonable timeline so that they can move on and address their vacancies? Okay. Um, well, the, the, what the Department of Health asked for was something different than this. They wanted to forego notifying applicants of the status of their application and that sort of thing and just wanted to pick and choose certain uh, applicants to interview and ignore the rest. That's what I find problematic about their request. So um, we're still discussing it and, and hope to find a, a happy medium with the Department of Health. But for now, under this new delegation, there are there's actually four things that the HR staff need to know. They need to be able to know how to screen applications. They need to know how to use our NeoGov system. Right now, they just see one side of it. They see the front end of it because they, they can post their own jobs in NeoGov, but they don't see the back end, the screening part. So we do need to provide them training for that part. We've trained a couple of departments in the last couple of weeks, and we'll be offering training to any other agency that reaches out and wants to get delegation um, because they need to understand how to use the software properly. Um, and, um, and then they need some training on how to handle appeals and things like that. Okay. because they'll be responsible for that as well. So, Director, I just have uh, one, one last question. Um, so, uh, are you familiar with uh, subsection D uh, that's, um, that's in the bill? And I'm, I'm referring to that very last uh, sentence there, that D heard shall complete any other tasks necessary to facilitate the hiring of an applicant, including auditing and correcting any errors found in the MQ review as applicable. So that's the MQ review that the departments are doing, correct? I, I assume so. Okay, so what if errors are found? Um, we have a responsibility to, to fix it, to um, either direct the department on how to correct the error or to undo what they've done. Okay, and what would be a reasonable time frame? Should you guys find some error? Because that's the, that's the concern that you, you really have right? Is that if there are any, um, if they're going to go lower than the current MQs, you're concerned that there's going to be some level of discrimination or, you know, large or small minor um, issues. So in the event that there are errors that are, that are not earth shattering, mm -hmm. that you can send back to the departments, hey, you know what, you know, we agree on most of this, but there's certain errors. What would be a, a, a reasonable time frame that you guys can get it back to the departments? Um well, we do um, what we call suitability review now. So yeah. um, we usually turn those usually around in a, a day or two. Okay. Um, there are certain questions that applicants answer and that we don't share with the department. So if there's a problem um, and we need to flag that for further review, we get back to, and we the department comes in and wants to hire that applicant, then we get back to them right away. But what I find- In a matter of a few days. Uh, within a day or two, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, that's nice. <laughs> We, and it, it, that part is quick. But what I find problematic is if the department is permitted to change the MQs, I'm not sure what we, what kind of recourse we have to say that that's not appropriate. Okay. All right. Thank you, Director. Members, any other questions? Okay, let's move on to the next measure, Chair. All right. We have the next one on the agenda is 2696, and this is Blake the Hino Wildfire Recovery. Uh, first up, we have Keith Regan, Comptroller. Written with comments, uh, we have Lahaina Strong. Mm -hmm. They have written comments too, like this bill better than the one I did. <laughs> and then we also have uh, Kioni Shizimu, individual, written in support. That's all the uh, testimony received on the measure. Um, since there's nobody here to testify, we don't have anybody to ask questions of. So with that, we will move on to the last bill on the agenda, which I handed over to the Labor Technology. All right, thanks, Chair. House Bill 1645, House Draft 1, related state position vacancies. Okay, Alps first, you have you heard, Director? Mm -hmm. I will stand on this written testimony providing comments. Okay, thank you very much, Director. Up next, we have United Public Workers. Okay, thank you very much, and HGEA. Here, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Ms. Staff, and she Thank you very much. Any others wishing to testify? Okay, seeing all members, questions? Okay, seeing all, we're going to recess briefly for decision making.
Okay, reconvening our 320 joint agenda between uh, GVO and LBT. Okay, up first we have House Bill uh, 1832, House Draft 1, relating to hiring. Uh, members, the recommendation is to move this as a Senate Draft 1. We're going to defect the date once again to July 1st, 2050 with some technical amendments. In addition to that, in Section 2D uh, that we alluded to during testimony, um, if errors are found uh, by DHER, uh, the department uh, will have five working days to correct and to send back to the department, okay? Uh, if there, again, if there are any errors, okay? Questions or concerns, members? Seeing none, Vice Chair for the vote. Mm -hmm. House Bill 1832 um, passed with amendments. Uh, Chair votes aye, Vice Chair votes aye. Senator Ihara? Uh, reservations. Reservations, okay. Um, Senator Lee excused. Senator Fabella. Right. The recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you. Uh, Committee on Government Operations, same recommendation. Uh, Senate Draft 1, I vote yes. Vice Chair Wakai, Senator Sandra Return. Aye. Senator Wakai? Yes. Senator Owa? Aye. Senator Fabella? Aye. Senator Okay, thank you very much. Uh, next bill on the agenda was House Bill 2696, House Draft 1, behind a wild recovery uh, measure. What we're going to do, members, is move this along for further conversation, um, bring it back to the Senate position, um, which we did, which is to add um, the senator from the district, including Lahaina, as well as the representative, to the oversight group. We also want to adopt the amendments made, um, suggested, which was out of the two council members, to ensure that one of the council members is from the West Mountain District. Uh, and a new defective date of 2112 as well for the SD5. Members, questions or comments? If not, Vice Chair, Senate Draft 1, I vote yes. Hey, Senator Senator. Aye. Senator Wakai? Yes. Senator Wallace, excuse. Measure passed. Thank you. Okay, Labor and Technology Committee, same recommendations. Questions or concerns? Vice Chair. Let's go 2696. All members present. Anyone voting no? The reservation. Reservation. Okay, recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on to the last House Bill 1645, House Draft 1. Ready to state position vacancies. Members, the recommendation is to move this as a Senate Draft 1 with a defective date of July 1st, 2050, and technical amendments. And we're going to also clarify that the annual report includes civil service as well as exempt positions in the report. Okay, questions or concerns, members? Vice Chair. House Bill 1645, all members present, anyone voting no, reservation, recommendation adopted. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Committee on Government Operations, same recommendation. Uh, Senate Draft 1, I vote yes. Members present for GBO, are there any no votes or reservations? Okay, measure passes. Okay, thank you very much. We're adjourned. Hey, aloha, everybody. Welcome to the Joint Committees on Government Operations, Agriculture, and Environment for our hearing today, Tuesday, March 14, 2024, uh, Conference Room 225. This meeting is being streamed live on YouTube. In the unlikely event, we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. We will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 3.08 p.m. Tuesday, March 19, 2024. In this conference room 225, a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. Uh, in order to facilitate this hearing in a timely manner, we will be enforcing the two-minute limit on testimony as is custom. Uh, with that being said, the first bill up on the agenda today is um, 2517. But, um, oh, I'm sorry, my bad. Oh, sorry, my bad. Wrong agenda. 2654. First up, we have Department of Health. They have written testimony in support. We have Paul Bernstein, HECA's Building Carbonization Task Force, written in support. 
Uh, Christopher Brees, Manager of Government Affairs for the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. Yeah. Uh, good Go afternoon, ahead, sir. Chair. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, chairs, vice chairs, and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Brzee. I'm with the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute, or AHRI. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to convey AHRI's strong support for HB 2, uh, 2654, uh, which will provide the HVAC industry with the certainty needed to comply with federal regulations, phasing down the use of hydrofluorocarbon refrigerants. Um, AHRI represents more than 330 manufacturers of air conditioning, heating, and commercial refrigeration equipment. Um, we have submitted uh, written comments, so we'll refer to those, but uh, this bill will essentially just allow uh, substitute refrigerants that are more climate friendly, uh, that have already been approved by the EPA, and that are mandated starting next year in 2025. Uh, to be used instead of why 45 states have adopted this through regulation or legislation. I'm um, just looking to get Hawaii to, to join that list. Um, and I'm here for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, we have Ken Bolin. Is he around? Uh, testifying climate protectors of Hawaii, it is in support. Um, that's all I have on the testifier sheet for this bill. Is there anybody in the audience or in Zoom that I might have missed wishing to testify? Uh, seeing none, that concludes this agenda. We want to be accessible before I the next one. Okay, well, let's, we're on the next agenda here. Then, unfortunately, though, um, to the 2517, but I don't have a testifier for this one. Oh, here's Lee? No, it's GVO. Let's take a recess. We'll take a recess briefly to sort this out. Hello, welcome back everybody. Sorry for the confusion. Um, okay, after conferring with my co-chair on this measure, um, the Senate version of this bill is moving along in the House further. And because it's advancing along quicker than this version, we're gonna defer this one indefinitely for now as that has become the vehicle of discussion. Okay, this concludes this joint hearing. Mahalo. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome back to a joint hearing between government operations and our friends at EET. Uh, today, Tuesday, March 14th, 2024, conference from 225, being streamed live on YouTube in the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties. Committees will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business at 3.09 p.m. Tuesday, March 19th, 2024, in conference from 225, and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. And again, to facilitate um, this hearing in a timely manner, we will be enforcing the customary two minute limit on testimony. With that being said, we're up first, uh, Bill, Government Operations 2517, House Draft 2, relating to renewable energy. First up, Mark Glick. Aloha Chairs, Vice Chairs, members of the committee, Maria Tomei, Hawaii State Energy Office. We will stand on our written testimony in strong support. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Uh, next up, we have City and County of Honolulu, written in support. We have, uh, let's see, Ulupono Initiative. Thank you, Chair. Ulupono has testimony in support. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Long Road Energy. Written in support, uh, Nicola Park, Clear, Clearway Energy Group. Hello, Chairs, Vice Chairs, members of the committee, Nicola Park, Director of Wise for Clearway Energy. We stand in support of our testimony, strong support, and available. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, we have Greg Shimokawa, Hawaiian Electric. Uh, they're not present on Zoom, Chair. They're not present on Zoom. Uh, they have written in support. We have Ruta Jordan's individual. Written in support, 2517. That's all I have for um, testifiers. Anybody in the audience or Zoom wishing to testify? Seeing none, members of, of either committee, are there any questions? Nope. Okay, then we will move on to the next bill, which uh, we are the lead again, 2738. Again, relating to renewable energy. And this is distributed energy special. First up, we have Hawaii State Energy Office. 
Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we have Dave Mullenix, uh, Greenpeace Hawaii. Uh, they are here on Zoom chair. They are. Okay. Yes. Oh, they are. They are not. Uh, oh, they are, are here. Yeah. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, thank you. Dave Melnick with Greenpeace Hawaii. We stand in strong support of this uh, legislation. Um, this is kind of um, essential, so to speak, um, because uh, as you may recall, um, they had a few uh, hurricanes um, in Puerto Rico and um, the hurricane, um, the last hurricanes wiped out their power grid and only one fire station had um, solar and backup uh, battery storage. So they were able to, to communicate with, with folks. Um, uh, we're having bigger hurricanes and, and um, more intense uh, weather because of climate change. And um, this uh, legislation is gonna help uh, protect our community by having the power they're gonna need during an emergency. And also for all uh, emergency um, um, organizations. So thank you very much. Please pass this legislation. It's a win-win it's a for everyone. And um, thank you so much. So much, sir. Uh, we have Sherry Polak, 350 Hawaii. Aloha, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, aloha chairs, vice chairs and committee members. My name is Sherry Pollack and I'm with 350 Hawaii. 350 Hawaii is in very strong support of this measure. We stand on our written testimony, but I just wanted to highlight that this bill, this lead by example measure for solar plus storage for state facilities with a priority for first responder facilities will um, be initially costing us some money, but ultimately it will save us money while protecting the climate. But at its core, this bill is about saving lives. And the better we're prepared for that next disaster that's bound to hit, we will save lives and be able to recover faster from whatever disaster has occurred. I only wish this bill had become law before the tragedy that occurred in Lahaina. Please pass this important measure and mahalo for the opportunity to testify on this wonderful bill. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, anybody else uh, in Zoom or in person wish to testify? If not, we also received written testimony from Keith Regan, uh, DAGS with comments, Susan Roberts Emery, Green Party of Hawaii in support written, Steve Parsons, uh, Kauai Climate Action Committee Coalition in support, Chamber of Sustainable Commerce written in support, uh, and we've also Rocky Mold, the ED for the Hawaii Solar Energy Association, written in support and numerous individuals all in support. That's all the testimony we received, last call. Anybody, members of either committee, questions? If not, I will turn it over to you. Oh. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. No, no, no. That is not good. You wish they were, they're not. Uh, okay, I will turn it over to my illustrious co-chair for the next one. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, up HB 2614 relating to renewable energy. Uh, first testifier, I'll be able to voice the energy office. We'll stand on our written testimony in strong support. Thank you. Uh, next, Gwen Yamamoto Lau, testifying for Green and Infrastructure Authority in support. Uh, Neil Arita from Contractors License Board. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committees. I'm Candice Nico, testifying on behalf of Neil Rita. I'm the, I'm the executive officer for the board. So um, the board stands on its written testimony in opposition. So we just want you to know that the board doesn't object to the intent of this bill to lower administrative barriers during the permitting process, but it does have serious concerns because this bill includes commercial on-site solar distributed energy resource systems, which do not appear to be suited to a self-certification permit process. Did we have? Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Sheena Choi, uh, testifying for Board of Professional Engineers, Architects Service. Thank you. Uh, next up, Chris Curtis Lum, Department of Planning and Permitting with comments. Michael Minikata from Olupono. Thank you. Next up, Ted Bolin with Climate Protectors of Hawaii. Climate Protectors will stand in strong support on the testimony. Thank you. Jeff Mikulina from Hawaii Executive Collaborative Climate Coalition in, 
person, maybe not in support. Rhino Ir Irwin testifying for Hawaii Unified Industries. Aloha, chairs, vice chairs, and committee. I uh, stand in strong, strong support of this bill. Um, I am the owner of Hawaii Unified. We are a local solar company based out in Makaha. We are the third largest employer on the Leeward Coast. Um, this bill is critical to the future of our industry. Uh, other contractors like mine have already uh, unfortunately become extinguished in the past year due to delays in permitting processes. Our residents here are currently having their solar contracts canceled because the finance companies cannot uh, continue to wait for these permits to come through. Uh, this is critical for our industry. It's critical for our, for our residents, uh, for our clean energy goals that we have here. If we don't pass this bill, uh, we are gonna considerably retract next year in our solar progress. And uh, this is the best way that they were using technology that's advanced. It's not just a self-certification. It is uh, using AI technology to review the plans and make sure that these permits are meeting code. So we already have made significant progress. I'm part of the DPP task force here in Honolulu. Um, however, this is the next step to take. Uh, we really need this bill to pass in order for solar to continue to uh, grow throughout the state. Uh, we have 60% of all permits in Honolulu County are solar permits right now. And that doesn't even count the, uh, the main panel upgrades that need to take place in order for solar to even happen on most people's homes now. So this is critical for, for us and our industry and I really support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, Sunova Energy Corporation. Aloha. Aloha. Annie McCuffigal on behalf of uh, Sonova Energy Corporation, we're in strong support of the measure. And to speak specifically to um, the bill uh, is um, um, asking for Solar App Plus. And just to give a little bit more um, specific specificity to it, Solar App is, uh, is free for local jurisdictions to use, has already been successfully deployed in other jurisdictions in multiple uh, municipalities across the nation, and um, it will um, reduce the permitting process time. And we're in strong support. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, next up, Dave Mullinick. Uh, for Greenpeace Hawaii on Zoom. Aloha, uh, Dave Mullins here, Greenpeace Hawaii. We stand in uh, strong support of this uh, legislation. Um, I, I think you're all aware that we have a scandal here in Hawaii uh, with the permit process so delayed. Some families have to wait up to a year or more to get their permit for a solar panel, which is just absurd. Uh, solar app used on the continent. In some places, they've been able to speed this up to like one day uh, approval. So uh, any concerns about this bill can be addressed. Um, it's very successful. As she said, it was free. Uh, as we all know that we are in a climate crisis. Uh, we, the climate scientists have just uh, reported not, not long ago that 2023 was the hottest year in human history. Next year is going to be even hotter. Uh, Secretary of the UN, uh, Anthony Gutierrez, said that we're on the road to climate hell if we don't get off of fossil fuels. And the best way to get off of fossil fuels is to expand solar panels uh, uh, across, we, and we have the best place in the country to do that. So I encourage you to support this bill. Uh, it's been passing through other uh, committees and uh, it's got a immense amount of support. Thank you so much for taking the time and for hearing this uh, legislation. Have a good day. Thank you. Next up, Lauren Zerbo, OE Food Industry Association on Zoom. They're unavailable on Zoom, Chair. Support, oh, thank you. Sherry Pollock, also in support on Zoom. Again, chairs, vice chairs, committee members, I'm Sherry Pollock with 350Y, and we stand in very strong support of this measure. Uh, we consider this measure a true game changer. Uh, establishing this requirement uh, to implement Solar App Plus or a functional equivalent. And this bill will, as you've heard from other testifiers, it will streamline online permitting for uh, solar and energy uh, storage projects. And you know, please note that this that the National Renewable Energy Laboratory developed Solar App Plus in a collaborative partnership with the industry and building safety community uh, with funding from the U.S. Department of Energy. And currently, as other testifiers have noted, 
families are, are waiting eight months, some more than a year to get their permit for it's just simple. These are simple solar projects and that's just unacceptable and must be remedied. Solar energy reduces greenhouse gas emissions and it's a key tool in our fight against the climate crisis. And this bill is a crucial step needed to help Hawaii meet its climate goals and it, reduce costs for residents uh, and also for, help us become more resilient. So we must remove these unnecessary roadblocks and burdens. And this is really, um, I would just consider a common sense measure, uh, please support it. And everyone really deserves to have the access to solar, uh, the benefits of solar. And um, again, thank you so much for hearing this measure today. Please pass it, uh, mahalo. Thank you. Uh, next up, Wayne Tanaka in support. Actually, we have 49 others in support of this bill. And I, I think I see Rocky, um, probably the only one here. Um, you want to say Chair something? Yeah. Thank you, Chair Quay, Chair McKelvey. I'm Rocky Mould. I'm the executive director of the Hawaii Solar Energy Association. Um, this bill, um, uh, we've been working really hard to improve permitting with the city and county and with the other counties. Um, this is a critical bill to get us to that next step to streamline permits. Per permit uh, delays and bottlenecks have been a big challenge for our industry and they're, they're currently getting in the way. While we've made significant progress, we need this bill to go to the next step. This will um, help the counties uh, implement online permitting, um, which, which they don't quite have yet. And then there's this self-certification provision, which will really get to the larger scale commercial projects um, that are currently um, very difficult to get through right now. And I'll just say that like in that um, self-certification process, um, the, the permit is not finally improved until after inspection. There, there will still be an inspection to approve the permit. It just allows developers to proceed to build uh, and actually take, their, take risk on their own back that the project will get through. So uh, the it, solar industry supports this bill. Uh, we strongly support this bill and thank you for taking the time to hear it. Um, and uh, I'm here for questions if you have them. Okay, thank you. Uh we, like I said, we get numerous support on the bill. Anybody else in the room wishing to testify on this measure? Seeing none, any questions? Uh, I, I Senator really McKelvey. Yeah. 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 I'm just curious, and this will help the counties. I, the counties didn't testify on this at all. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, what? I mean, did they, did they need help from the state and just couldn't they do this on their own? Um, so DPP testified, um, their, tes their testimony is in there. And what I saw in DPP's testimony is one, they support online. They, they, they talk about the benefits of online permitting and how it's really a must. So this bill will help um, provide the sort of political capital and support for counties. Well, can they just do it on their own right now? Can DPP just do it? They don't. Um, they, can't, they have to be enabled by this legislation to do it. I'm so sure. I just happen to know that from a from a the administration supports this bill, and then what happens is it goes down into DPP, and there's pushback from you know for from you know various folks for various reasons because change is hard. This is a significant positive change, and change is difficult. And so what we see is just really friction to do to do this change and to implement these changes. So this bill will really help by giving, putting the wind at the sails for, for passing solar permitting so at those DPP counties. So you're saying isn't supporting the mayor and the council, and so the state needs to come in and tell it what to do? I mean, because, I mean, I mean, normally with these kinds of things, we want with the state permitting, state building, state building, and solar app plus, I mean, you know, in our, in our neck of the, you know, right, in our neck of the woods, you know, for us, for the state side, but for the counties, I mean, shouldn't this be push being, being made by all the stakeholders on the mayor and the council from that end? So absolutely, where the rubber meets the road is at the counties. And, um, but this bill will, again, um, help support um, the passage of these, of these policies uh, at the county. It will give them the support to do that. Currently, there's, just, there's not enough kind of momentum for making these changes for these really common sense measures um, for permitting right now. But yes, I mean, the rubber meets the road at the counties. And if you look at the at DPP's testimony, again, I'll point out that they say that online permitting is a must, and we want to get this out to, to Maui and the, and the right, Big Island. And, and they also say that on the self-certification side, that they passed Ordinance 2339 uh, mm -hmm. past year, and that is a self-certification provision 
for tenant improvements, uh, as well as affordable housing. They wanted to have a solar component to that self-certification bill, but it got edited out. And what they're saying, what they've told me is that if this bill passes, it will help them go to amend ordinance 2339 with solar for it. So there's a specific potential for, you know, helping them to pass something that they wanted to pass. But they edited it out themselves. Uh, it was edited out by council. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay, oh, Senator San Bonaventura. Okay, thank you, and, and um, thank you. Sure. So I, I, I agree, I looked at the DPP um, testimony, and surprisingly, they were in support so long as it's a functional equivalent because the county of Honolulu already has one, which goes to Senator McKelvey's question, why do we need the bill if the county already has one? For, so currently 60% of, uh, of permits go through their online equivalent. It's for that other 40% where we need solar app. Um, it, it's it's more complicated permits that are in uh, flood zone area, flood zones and uh, improvement districts and things like this. And there there are a lot of permit applications that come from these areas. So it's really for the city and county, the solar app portion is really for those harder to reach uh, uh, segments because the online system works for about sixty percent of online permits right now, maybe less now uh, with with that. And and the counties, um, our neighbor islands, don't have uh, solar app. And I think Maui County, the mayor of Maui, I believe, submitted testimony in the last hearing. You can look it up in support of this bill. But I didn't. I, I checked. I did not see his testimony. Yeah, but he can do it now. Yeah. I mean, in Maui County. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's what that, I'm that, saying. That, that's, a, that's a thing. Okay. The other thing is, um, and I don't know if you can answer. We don't have Doug Murdoch's testimony. My concern with free apps, and I understand it's a government app, is upkeep especially when we have had a number of hacks. Mm -hmm. Okay, healthcare, I mean, we just had a huge breakdown of pharmaceuticals um, hacking so that people can't even get their meds now. Mm -hmm. How do we, who pays for the upkeep for this solar app plus? Does anyone know? I mean, there, there, are, two, there are two versions of it. There's a version that can be integrated uh, uh, with uh, DPP or a planning department's current enterprise system. And that takes a, some, some work up front. But there's also a version that's like, an, is, is housed on servers at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, US Department of Education. So the US Department of Education upkeeps, or sorry, energy, I meant energy. US Department of Energy uh, does the upkeep. Yeah. Sorry, the, the DOE energy here is, is education. Yeah. Um, is anybody here from the energy office that can yeah. confirm? Yeah, why don't you come on up? So, okay, sure. yes. Sorry. Oh, no problem. I, I want I want a third party. Yeah, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory has developed this application. I I, I, I understand. I no one is disagreeing with that. The question, Norma, my question is, since we don't have Murdoch's testimony, how do we prevent hacking? Who, who pays for the security? Nobody, Nobody knows. Okay. The U.S. Department of Energy. Yeah, U.S. Department of Energy. They're gonna they're come, come, it. come in front of you. I mean, because you're gonna you're gonna see people's homes on this thing, permitting and. So the way that this system works is you simply are putting in an application and you also submit the plans for that application and it scans it with AI to make sure that's meeting code. These codes, electrical codes, are changing every few years. We're actually a couple years behind. Every time that these new codes get implemented and have to be reviewed, personally here, our system has to be upgraded. And we have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars for software upgrades to make sure that we're meeting these code requirements. By moving to the Solar App Plus, they're doing this on a federal level and you, keeping you, up with this. You know, you, you, I used to be a computer program before I became a lawyer. So... Technology has sold me on a number of things, except for the hacking part, okay? So I, I could see AI and its potential, but no one here is answering my question. How do we prevent hacking? Because if you're gonna be putting this out on the web, you're gonna see people's addresses, TMKs, 
for the permit that's out there. And I, I don't think unless, yeah. and frankly, unless I see Doug Murdoch's testimony as to how we could how we could um, increase security, I'm for sorry, pointing it to the county using their own apps because then the liability ends with them. <laughs> The, I can just say that the own apps, like even that 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 stat, sixty percent of all permits right now are solar. There's six thousand backlog. It's not working what we're doing. Sixty percent get automatically approved, but they're not being adequately reviewed. And we're not even talking about the other thirty percent of all of our solar projects need a main panel upgrade. Those all have to go through a manual review that takes six plus months. Like if we're going to move forward in clean energy. We're not going to do it this way. It's 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 not going to happen. We're not going to meet these goals. We well, need fifty thousand roofs. The energy person is coming up. I, I, okay. I want to hear somebody from the government. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's my understanding. Well, the permit, all permits are, pub are public. Yeah, they're already public. So anyway, you're yeah, saying yeah. 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 I, I, well, I mean, I know the city kind of put a little stuff all online. I'm not sure. But, but, but why anyway, do we need but, this if this yeah, the, the, already the doing it? Right? The fog, all the permit clogs in the county. Yes, but what this does is it issues an instant it. permit. Yeah, it, 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 it evaluates the plans to make sure it meets code compliance and it issues an instant permit that our city and county can take that permit and not only do they have a permit, now they have an extensive inspection worksheet to checklist when they go out and then do the inspection that they can make sure everything is code compliant. Oh no, I get you. And, and they need they haven't done it yet. They have the, the city and the, the, the counties and and the city and county have not improved enough. It's while they've improved a lot, they need a lot more improvement to get to the kind of scale and speed that's necessary to meet our goals. And so this is impelling them to do that. We're asking the state to take a position and to help us move along and, and help us incentivize the counties um, and their departments to to um, to act at the speed and scale that's necessary to meet the need. So I, I, I guess what Senator Sam Buenavent is asking is, what does the liability lie in regards, because I'm going to tell you about AI. We were just, we just got back about issues on AI and it's about who owns the right once AI is used. So federal legislation has come down and saying anytime you use an AI model, whose responsibility is AI and does AI own everything that you run through the app? So I believe that's the question that uh, Senator San Buenaventura is trying to put across. I think where, wherever the data lies would be who's liable. And so if the database, if it's the integral system that's, you know, that's, um, you know, built within the enterprise system, it would be the liability of the counties. If it's on the NREL site, that, that other model, which is, you know, it housed on servers, you know, on the, you know, for, for NREL, it would be NREL, I would guess. Federal, Federal yeah. So the state's not involved. Yeah. Again, so, again, we're back to the same question. Same question, mm -hmm. you know. Do we need uh, the <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. California has made this state mandate every single city and county municipality is moving to Solar App Plus. So, so the state then, model yeah. exists in other states where the state has come in yeah. and compelled uh, jurisdictions. The, yeah. mandate. the state is going to mandate that the counties do this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Senator Gabbard. Yeah, so can you state your name? and? Uh, My name is Rhino Irwin. I. I'm the, I'm the CEO of Hawaii Unified. We're uh, one of the top five solar companies here out in the Leeward Coast. Ryan, so noting the urgency in your, your voice in terms of, uh, and also being from the West Side, do you think that the January 1st, uh, 2025 uh, implementation deadline is realistic, or do you think it could be done soon? Um, it could be done much sooner. According to Solar App Plus and the, the people that we've talked to there, they could have it rolled out in four weeks. Uh, with the model, yeah. the, the, again, that, that, that's, that third party model or the model where the servers of NREL are used, that can be done very quickly. If it's the enterprise system model, the, uh, it would take probably a, a while. And so six months 
uh, would probably be aggressive for doing some kind of large integration for an enterprise system at the city and county. However, I think what they're looking at is that that other model, the, the you know the the model where NREL houses the the data. In Rocky Wall, uh, DPP testified in favor of. Uh, did you notice kind of like uh, you've spoken with them before? Did you notice this kind of like well we've never we've always done it this way kind of mentality as far as some hesitancy in moving forward or. So we've had a very intensive um, dialogue uh, with the city and county, with DPP and with the administration on this. Um, and uh, we, we're, there's a DPP solar PV task force that meets every other month. We were meeting monthly for a while because there was a huge backlog issue a couple a year ago. Um, we're meeting every other month now um, and we're going through issues one by one and we're, we're get, getting improvements done, but there is a palpable frustration uh, that I see not just on the solar side, but also on the administration side with wanting to change and not having enough sort of ability to move that change internally. So I see that and I, and I can't speak for them, um, but, I, but I feel like there are things blocking it that um, e even, if, even with administrative will, um, there's a lot of work to be done to, 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 to get this through. Um, technically, you know, and implement it, uh, you know, at the, at the ground level. Oh, any other questions? See none. A recess for decision making. Um. All right, welcome back to the Joint Committees on Government Operations, uh, and uh, we have uh, EET. Uh, next, first up, we have House Bill 2517, House Draft 2, relating to renewable energy. Uh, our recommendation uh, is that because the Senate version is moving faster along in the House of Representatives, uh, with the language that was requested to be included in this, we're just going to defer this one indefinitely. So that becomes the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next one, House Bill 2738, House Draft 2, recommendation is a Senate Draft 1. Uh, we're going to make the following changes. We're going, to we're going to be mandating as opposed to authorizing to apply to all the parts. Page 6, line 6, insert cost-effective energy efficiency measure means any energy efficiency measure where the cost of the energy efficiency measure is equal to or less than the estimated savings over a period of 20 years or the life of the installed components, whichever is less. Page six, line 18, we're gonna remove the word facilities. And then the report, we're gonna have the reporting be done to the legislature, it doesn't say who it's done to. So we're gonna make it to us and make it mandatory. A new defective date of 2112 uh, for further review of the new amendments and technical non-substantive changes for clarity, consistency, and style. Members, questions and comments? If not, Vice Chair, 27 and 38, HD2, SD1, I vote yes. Passing with amendments. Vice Chair what's I, Senator San, San Bernardino Ventura. Aye. Senator Wakai. Yes. Senator Awa. Aye. Measure passed. Thank you. Same request. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Chair goes aye. Sorry. Vice Chair votes yes. Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator Kim and Favela are excused. Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Uh, uh, next bill, HB 2614. Recommendation is to pass as an SD1, defecting the date to January 1st, 2060. Acknowledging in the committee report the concerns of security measures of hacking of a system, as well as noting that the counties can already do it. Um, we are moving this down so that we can continue the conversation. Um, with that, uh, Vice Chair, for the vote, Chair goes aye. I vote yes, Senator Fukunaga. Aye. Senator Kim, if you're better excused, Chair, your recommendations adopted. Thank you. Okay, uh, Committee on Government Operations, same recommendation. Uh, Senate Draft 1, I vote yes. For GVO, all members present, are there any no votes or reservations? Hearing none, the measure passed. Okay, this concludes the joint hearing. Thank you much, everybody.